Good evening, everyone. I am Banduka, coordinator for technical events, civil engineering sectional committee. Welcome you all to the second session of our webinar series on the structural design of highway bridges. And it's my pleasure to welcome back our esteemed and well-known speaker, Professor Jayasinghe. And for those of you who may have missed the last session, Professor Jayasinghe is an expert in the field of civil engineering with a focus on cost-effective structural designs. He has a wealth of knowledge and experience in the area of highway bridges, making him the perfect resource person for this session. I would like to express our gratitude to Professor Jayasinghe for his valuable contribution to this webinar series. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, first I'll share the screen. So So last time uh, I introduced the bridges and flyovers to a certain extent and uh, uh, there are a few other things that I want to show before I start, move on to reinforce concrete. So uh, we'll quickly move to that. And so basically last time we talked about the kind of loads that we lacked on structure and then we went on to see different types of bridges like this. So I told you that, you know, we started with this type of bridges where we filled it with concrete and then we went for precasting operation with uh, uh, this uh, top slab only. The reason for precasting was um, most of the time it's difficult to do homework. So anything that we precast and place is of significant advantage. And then we went for this modern beam that is called Y beam, and you can get the information on uh, Y beam touching each other and also uh, located at a uh, sorry, touching at one uh, sorry, located at one meter spacing and two meter spacing. So uh, you can straight away get the guideline and decide which type of beam that you need uh, depending on the span. So the bridge looks like this. You can uh, inspect the top slab. The soffit of the so top slab can be inspected and any repair can be attended. And uh, so because of that, it's of uh, particular advantage. And you can go up to 31 meters. And then we briefly talked about the flyovers in Sri Lanka. And uh, then we uh, also, uh, uh, we came to the Orgodotha flyover where I said that, you know, we used uh, box beams. Right. So this Orugodotha flyover is uh, one of the widest and longest bridges, the flyovers in Sri Lanka. And you can see, you know, it, uh, this is the, this is not the original design. Original design was very close to the Matakuli bridge. Uh, I showed uh, a photo of that earlier but I will show a photo uh, that that consisted of uh, box guard box beams box beams and there are about 10 box beams instead of 10 box beams we use only four uh, box girders and uh, this is Matakulia bridge having uh, box beams and this is the shape of a box beam that we use for that and uh, these box beams were uh, placed side, uh, you know, with a gap. And then uh, the form work was uh, connected to the beams and then the deck was formed. And that's how this particular bridge was uh, constructed. And the cost of this particular bridge was, uh, the estimate was 210 million and in it was completed for 200 million rupees. And uh, so 
Then this is another bridge where I beams have been used. Uh, this is again a value engineering solution that we did. And Mag Engineering completed the bridge with the new uh, new shape I, I beams in a very short period, like four months. And uh, this is again another, you know, uh, uh, kind of I beams that you can use. Right. And then, uh, so we'll uh, today briefly talk about value engineering and the value engineering that I used for uh, Urugodwatha flyover. And this value engineering solution was developed at the request of the contractor. The contractor came to us and then RDA allowed us to go for a value engineering solution. And uh, the length of the Original length of the flyover was uh, 300 meters plus the access abutments, sorry, access uh, ramps out of uh, uh, reinforced concrete, uh, reinforced earth construction uh, for the um, retaining walls. So the length was 330 meters. Uh, so what happened was when we went for the value engineering solution, we found that it's better to add one more span rather than going with the embankment. So, because of that reason, the length of the bridge became 330 meters with co uh, concrete plus uh, access uh, for the rest was for the access. And the total length was about higher than 20 meters, more than half a kilometer. And the total cost was uh, 540 million without pipe diversion. This is the original cost 540 million without pipe diversion. The reason is this particular road is uh, from Amatale to Kalambo. So Amat from Amatale, we have all the uh, water supply pipelines coming to Kalambo. So the original design of RDA had uh, about 10 piles. Uh, so because of that, uh, there was a huge uh, cost associated with uh, diverting the pipes to allow for pipe uh, pile uh, construction. So the cost of pipe diversion was 260 million. And what we did was, uh, the contractor actually came up with the idea. The contractor said, uh, rather than using uh, 10 piles of one meter diameter, uh, they proposed using uh, four piles of 1.2 diameter. So instead of 10 piles, uh, the number of piles was reduced to four. And then uh, when, you, when you do that, there are many other problems to be solved. So I'll briefly explain uh, the various problems that we encountered and how those were solved. So the uh, original one was uh, 10 box beams as for the Matakulia bridge. And uh, uh, foundation was 10 numbers of 1 meter diameter piles. So this needed the pipe diversion. The cost of pipe diversion was 260 million rupees. So the total cost of the project was 800 million rupees. So value engineering was initiated by the Chinese contractor. So as I have shown you, we we, we used four box girders. And then uh, we also used four, B, four piles of 1.2 diameter. So, so basically, can you hear me properly? Yes, sir. We can hear you properly. Okay, okay, thank you. So, so you can see there's a substantial saving uh, in the pipe diversion cost because uh, the pipe diversion needed was reduced to only 60 million worth of work. And uh, RD was also given some discount. So, uh, out of 800 million, we completed the bridge for about 550 million. So, uh, so it was uh, over 560 million, a saving of 240 million rupees. So that was a significant one, and we can learn a lot from that particular project. And here you can see the kind of beams uh, that have been used. And uh, this again, the kind of the same beam uh, with the reinforcement arrangement. And uh, you can see some uh, reinforcement used for uh, so, but there are a few other reinforcers that is not shown here. So there will be some reinforcement at 
these locations in the diagonal direction as well. So he, this is how it was cast. Uh, the, so, and then this is the end block and the stressing and the, with the anchors and you can see the anchoring and uh, the beams cast with uh, provision for connection between uh, between the beams with the uh, uh, top slab and uh, here you can see the kind of arrangement used for uh, correcting the reinforcement and then we saw the equipment used for lifting and uh, so this these are these are figure during construction and here you can see uh, you know the piers with huge cantilevers and if you ask what is the length of this cantilever the length of the cantilever is 5.5 meters then uh, you'll ask how you make it possible for the first time in sri lanka we used uh, pre-stressing in the pier capping beam the reason is that we have reduced the width of the pier to only about 4 meters and this was uh, 16 15 uh, uh, for, uh, uh, about 16 meters minus 4 meters uh, you get 11 meters so the remaining 5.5 meters would be the cantilever so here you can see the bearings for the uh, beam so you can see the, the beam here would come fully away from the the pier capping beam or the pier so the pier is here the beam is here and there is another beam here so that is the arrangement and uh, this, this is how they actually move the beam because the weight of a beam was about 140 tons. So Chinese contractor used uh, very simple uh, uh, pulling mechanisms by using jacks and uh, they created a rail arrangement so that the beams can be easily moved on rails. So, so the deck slab was 200 millimeter uh, thick. And here you can see the beams have been placed with a with a gap, and then uh, later the the total the whole thing is fully uh, concreted, as you can see here, as you can see here. So, and uh, so basically, uh, right? Okay. So there was another thing uh, I will not touch on this particular subject later with us. But I will, uh, I have to now talk a little bit about how we did the analysis. So when you are doing um, analysis, another day I will uh, spend more time on this analysis and I will explain how bridges can be modeled for various uh, situations. And uh, for that, uh, before that, I will just briefly touch on the analysis just to give you some idea. So here you can see a uh, bridge. If the, if the bridge is behaving like a slab, you can convert that slab to a, a grid of beams or you can even go for this kind of three-dimensional shell elements for analysis. And then you can easily form a grid edge like this to replace the deck because the deck is loaded perpendicular to the uh, Perpendicular to its plane. So any structure that is loaded perpendicular to its plane is called a grillage. Whereas if the structure is loaded in its own plane, it's called a frame. So this is a grillage, and the difference between a grillage and a frame is frame is subjected to bending moments, shear forces, and axial forces. Grillage is subjected to bending moments, shear forces, and torsional. So if you consider one element here, a bending moment on this particular element will be a torsional moment for the perpendicular moment. So you get torsional moments and bending moments. So to create a structure like this, you can use a popular software like uh, SAP 2000 or MIDAS uh, Civil and you can easily create a set of elements in one direction set of elements in the perpendicular direction and they are all connected at the joints and then you have to allocate the 
appropriate sectional sizes for each of these sediments. And once you have this, you know, you can uh, apply the loads representing the highway loads. For example, this is a uh, HA load, A type load, applied on one lane. And similarly, you can have a knife edge load applied on one lane. And uh, you can have uh, the, the these, uh, these, are, these are model made for uh, earlier British standard loading. So you can see this HA vehicle having uh, two axles in the front and two axles in the rear. And when you have uh, axles over a certain number of uh, beams, you will get some load sharing or load being transferred to more than one or two, two nodes. But here you can see HB vehicle is actually transferring the nodes onto four, four nodes. Because uh, it's, it's not directly on a particular node. It is in between the nodes. So because of that reason, we can transfer the load. And another uh, important thing is that, you know, you can have all these uh, pedestrian loads and then the asphalt, concrete weight, all those things applied on the on this. And then once you run the analysis, uh, before running the analysis, you have to ensure that on at one side, the beam, the grid edge is fixed to the fixed. And on the other side, it's free to move. It's free to move. The support conditions are very important. And then you can get the bending moments and shear forces and the torsional moments. You can get torsion. So once you know the bending moments, torsional moments and shear forces, if you look at, if you are using British standard or Euro standards, all these codes give you uh, straightforward design methods to find the reinforcement requirement to resist the bending moments, shear forces, and torsional moments. So it's a straightforward, once you know the bending moments, shear forces, it's a straightforward design task. And if you want to know how exactly it can be done, you can refer any book written, or written according to BS, uh, BS codes or any book written accord in accordance with Euro codes. And if you are not very familiar with uh, concrete design for Euro codes, uh, what I recommend strongly is uh, the book by Mosley and Bungie, uh, sixth edition or seventh edition. And uh, it covers, uh, it gives a very good insight. It, it is a very well written book in a very simple terms. And uh, it's a very useful book for you to learn. And when you are using that book, you can easily write a set of simple uh, spreadsheet programs to, uh, uh, you know, perform the task, repetitive tasks. So it gives very good examples for shear, cal shear calculation. And also it gives, a, it gives very good examples for to torsional moment calculations and torsional reinforcement calculations. So what I what I strongly recommend is for you to go through this book uh, step by step. And if you do it early in the morning, it's even better because uh, uh, then, you know, there are, there are equations that are derived. So all these derivations, everything will be properly stored in your memory if you uh, try, uh, if you read this kind of books early in the morning. So, uh, then, uh, now you can see uh, what we what we have done is uh, we have precast the beams and then uh, then the deck is cast and at each span uh, they are not continuous. But uh, in Sri Lanka this is not a major problem. But uh, in many other countries they don't like this type of bridges because they get enough problems with the expansion. Uh, the actual problem comes with the corrosion associated with expansion joints because these expansion joints tend to leak. And uh, in those coal countries, they use de-icing salts. And because of that reason, you will find that, you know, maintaining these expansion joints and then preventing corrosion at the expansion joints is a major problem. So they like, they don't like this type of uh, 
discontinuous bridges they like continuous bridges so so you have to consider how you make them continuous and uh, when you are analyzing the bridge uh, the bridge is considered continuous only for the live loads or any load that comes after the continuity is rested so if you have uh, continuous bridges you can have different types of joints and uh, though the bridge is bridge beams are pre stressed concrete the continuity comes with reinforced concrete so the continuity comes with reinforced concrete so there are so many different methods these are the american preferred methods but uh, the british methods would be something like this and then uh, there are many other variations and uh, for orugodorta bridge we use something like similar to this but actually it is very similar to this particular where we we constructed the bridges as continuous but made, we made them discontinuous and then we covered the joint with polysulfide and then uh, if you want you can have a jo textile uh, at that location to prevent any water going through to through the joint and then you can have asphalt concrete asphalt concrete and when you do this uh, sometimes a minor crack might appear but uh, the riding quality is very good and uh, when you look at the type of um, uh, the temperature variations that we get in sri lanka this type of joints work very well the reason is our temperature variations are very small so so this is the type of joint that we have used in orogodorta flyover and after uh, about 10 15 years you might get a slight crack that you can easily uh, easily uh, uh, seal with bitumen and then you know the other components in the bridge would be the uh, substructure consisting of piers and abutments and uh, this is a different separate topic so i will not discuss it in detail today but we can discuss it discuss it, discuss it. in greater detail in a later day so we'll skip this particular part of the presentation and then again uh, the, the access uh, ramps are out of reinforced earth and here you can see this retaining wall hasn't got a big structure it has only a surface uh, it has only the surface elements and from the surface element there will be uh, metal strips galvanized metal strips arranged this way so uh, the soils in this region will be in a tension zone uh, soil in this region will be in a compression zone what we do is we get this uh, steel strips take them through the tension zone and anchor them in the compression zone so this is a very uh, straight forward construction method that we call reinforced earth and this is very popular in uh, other countries and for this particular project we use reinforced earth access road and here you can see it's a it's a fairly cheap construction method and you can get a vertical wall and these are the units that have been used and here you can see these hooks are there from which you can actually uh, anchor the strips like this and then uh, fill it with soil so that uh, the the tension zone here will be anchored into the compression zone and there's another there's another thing that you have to consider that is access slabs access slabs so when you in, in many of our bridges you would have seen that you know the access access embankment has uh, settled but not the bridge so so the vehicles uh, enter the bridge uh, uh, suddenly because uh, you can see there's a depression very close to the bridge so to prevent that having uh, ha happening that then you can actually make use of something called a running slab so in the case of running slabs what we do is we will actually uh, say this is a kind of a box girder and here we place a slab uh, supported by a cobble hobel so actually uh, the vehicle enters here and this running slab is free to rotate so that the, the vehicle can enter the bridge with a smooth ride so this is a kind of a running slab here and here you can see the detail with the with the with the cobble stone and uh, it's, it's a cobble beam not a stone and here you can see the running slab is supported with simple reinforced cement 
So the, when the vehicles come, the vehicles enter the honey slab, uh, and then only it will enter the bridge. And then uh, you can have massive foundations for uh, for bridges, bridge apartments, and this one of the apartments used in uh, uh, in Hammadpur district, uh, elevated uh, crossing, so great separated crossing. Or basically, this is the flyover foundation. And what happened in this particular case was the foundation bedrock was uh, in only about 20 feet or six meters below. So there was no way that you can do finding. So the Marvel engineering excavated it to the bedrock. Then they have driven uh, dowels into the. So these are the steel. These are dowels. And then they did the concrete straight away. So this is uh, just to keep the cost lower because uh, you know you get a simple straightforward structure. And this is a this is a pile cap in Orgodovat flyover project. And here you can see again uh, there are piles and the pile cap is covering four piles, and then it will support the four meter wide uh, pier. And the pier will have 5.5 can meter cantilevers on either side. And then it, it will support four beams uh, at the appropriate height. And here you can see some welding has been used, which is not a major problem these days because we are using QST bars, which are actually weldable metals without losing stem. And then tremie pipes have been used. Right. So, Right now we have a big foundation, big pipe. Here you can see it covers 1.2 diameter piles, and so it's about uh, uh, 4.5 meter by 4.5 meter by about 1.5 meter thickness. So if you do not get it right, you can run into a huge problem. And this is one of the pile caps in Southern Highway from uh, from. Uh, Kurudga Hakanme to Mathura, one of the bridge foundations, and you can see the pile cap has cracked, huge cracks. So this is called delayed etringite formation. And uh, so if you want to prevent this type of cracks occurring, uh, you have to very carefully control the temperature so that the temperature will not rise above 70 degrees. So I'm going to explain this in greater detail today under concrete technology, because if you are going for any kind of concrete bridges, especially reinforced concrete or pre-stressed concrete or composite construction, then it's very important that we understand what you are doing with concrete. So what is the technology behind concrete? So I'm going to explain it in significant details and I can again touch on this particular subject and this is called a delayed etching guide formation. And how you avoid this delayed etching that formation is by having uh, uh, galvanized tubes inserted into the very large concrete section and then uh, pumping cool water to the pipes when the concrete is placed. So what happens is these pipes will remove part of the heat of hydration and you can reduce the rise in temperature. And then there are software that will allow us to uh, fairly, fairly reason, you know, determine the temperature rise possible with a reasonable accuracy. And uh, by using uh, this software and also calibrating the results, we actually developed a set of curves. So the, the idea of the curve is that if you know the cement content and uh, so 325, is a third curve, you can decide what is the thickness that is allowed. So here you can see anything more than 600 millimeters, 600, 500, 600, 700, 800. 800 millimeter thickness is vulnerable for having a temperature more than 70 degrees. And when you have a temperature more than 70 degrees, you will find uh, the al tricassium aluminate uh, reverses back to its original form 
and then it will again you know will gradually be converted back to the the product that you get after the reaction and uh, the problem is that the product that you get after the hydration of tricalcium aluminate has a bigger volume than the original volume so what happens is uh, it can exert huge pressure outwards and when these kind of huge pressures are exerted the pile caps can crack as i have shown you so to, pre to prevent that <coughs> you have to make sure that the maximum temperature remains below 70 degrees and uh, when you are doing a design you don't know anything about the maximum temperatures so well, you can use these charts as a guideline now let's say <coughs> you are having uh, a member with 1500 millimeter thickness so one of the options that is available for you is to ready, keep the cement content at 275 kilograms per meter cube so you can see the temperature below 70 degrees is assured so likewise you can get very positive feedback from a set of curves like this and then uh, now today you know that you know we have fly ash and fly ash can help us in a big way and uh, so basically this is a curve for 15 percent fly ash and uh, here you can see uh, if you have 1500 millimeter thickness even if you use a total cementitious content cementitious material content of 325 kilograms per meter cube like uh, 275 kilograms of uh, cement and 50 uh, kilograms of fly ash and uh, so you can easily have a total cementitious content of 325 kilograms per meter cube and then when you cast the beam uh, cast the section you will see the maximum temperature reached is less than 70 so uh, as a design engineer this is very useful information because whenever you want to design and you want to decide the grade of content uh, then uh, you can get, use this as a guideline so for example you know you can get any grade but you, you the maximum you can the cement you can use with the uh, fly ash is 325 kilograms per meter now we have to see how we gain the strength and for that we can make use of admixtures. By using admixtures, we can reduce the cement content in a very significant manner, but still gain the strength. So, so, the, so that's the that's a that's a kind of an art. And now I'm going to teach you how to uh, how we can understand it well, and then. Once you have an understanding, you yourself can start playing with the numbers and coming up with very economical concrete mixes. And I would have to say, in Sri Lanka, we have been very liberal in using cement <laughs> because uh, cement remained below 800, 900 rupees, or so let's say 1000 rupees per bag. So, uh, even for low strength concrete, I have seen uh, some using about 350 kilograms per meter cube, which is uh, which is little on the high side. So basically, we have to see how we can get uh, high strength concrete with minimum use of cement, with minimum use of cement, and that is something that I am going to explain today. Before we start the proper lecture on reinforced concrete and the concept behind the value engineering solutions that you can perform on uh, reinforced concrete sites. So here you can see another another chart, 25% fly ash. And even if you have 2.2 meter thick section, still it's not a major problem because uh, uh, say with a two meter thick section, and you can use up to this particular 
curve which is 275, 300, 300, 350. So you can go up to 350 kilograms per meter cube of cement plus by ash. And uh, then you can easily get a section that will never ever have delayed entering the formation, provided you have taken some precautions to keep the placing temperature, because placing temperature is also important, and generally we recommend the use of uh, flaky ice and so on, and reducing the placing temperature uh, to be less than 30, to be less than 30 degrees. And again, you can see why many people like to start construction, concreting work, around 8 o'clock in the night and continue into, into the midnight. The reason is uh, when you do concrete, uh, starting fairly late, the, te the outside temperatures are low, the thermal gains of the truck mix is also low, so you will have a huge uh, chance of actually placing the concrete below 30 degrees, uh, provided at the back plant, they, again they can do two things. One is, the, you know, for mixing water, for about 25 to 30 percent of mixing water, they can use flaky ice. They can use ice, flaky ice. And then uh, the other thing that they can do is, uh, uh, you know, you can keep the aggregate wet the previous day. So what happens is when you apply water to a heap of aggregates, uh, the water evaporates. And when the water is evaporating, it will take, get the heat of hydration, sorry, it will get the uh, energy needed for evaporation from the aggregates, so aggregates will become cooler. So that's a very, very useful method to keep the placing temperature down because uh, you make concrete by using ingredients that are at a lower temperature. So I will not again touch too much on fears, we can come back to it. But uh, to, before we start the lecture series, it's good to know in a bridge, we get foundation, which can be a rough foundation or a pine foundation. And then we get substructure. So piers and abutments are called substructure. And superstructure is called the deck. The deck is called superstructure. Substructure means not foundation, it is the structure below the deck and above the ground level and below the ground level it's called foundation. Now here you can see again something significant and uh, the kind of reinforcement used in uh, the pier capping. Beam and then you, here you can see the kind of tendons that have been placed and again uh, you cannot do uh, after completing the concrete you cannot stress all these tendons at once because if you try to do that what will happen is the bridge uh, the uplifting here will be so much the the pier capping beam will definitely fail uh, by forming cracks underneath so what we do is we actually go for two stage pre-stressing. In the first stage, we stress only the top tendons, which are going straight, almost straight. And then uh, we'll uh, stress the curved ones later. So by doing that, you can actually uh, prevent any cracks because what we are going to do is, first we'll place these, uh, stress these, place the beams. So the beams will push the pier capping beam back onto the pier and after that we will do uh, pre-stressing. So once you place the beams and the, do the deck slab and all that, there will be a lot of forces acting downwards. So that will allow us to again apply a stress and give it enough strength to keep the or to resist the loads due to line loads. Because once you place the beams, then it's a dead load is okay. But once you place the uh, 
the deck and complete the bridge and then the bridge is used by uh, the vehicles. Now you have to resist the weight of the vehicles, transfer the weight of the vehicles onto the pier. How do you do that? For that we can make use of free stress concrete. We can make use of free stress concrete. So under this lecture series, we are going to talk about free stress concrete also in a later day. In a later day. So now here you can see some of these beams are placed well away from the pier. Uh, the, the edge of the pier is here. The beam is here. So. Once completed, the, the bridge looks like this and you can see some of these beams are actually placed just well away from the pier and it's not a major problem because we have gone for a two-stage pre-stressing and applied sufficient pre-stress so that uh, the, the pier capping beams will not, uh, will not have any strength related problem. It will have enough flexural strength on all these sections because it's uh, the loads here have been taken onto the pier and transferred via the pier. So that's what you see in this particular bridge. And uh, so here you can see uh, pre stressing in the beams and pre stressing in the pier capping beams. But when it came to uh, the, the piers, and the abutment, they were all reinforced concrete. And this is what you, it looks like. And you can see uh, no, no noticeable uh, expansion joints in this big, except one at the beginning, one at the end. Can you hear me? Any, any problem or? No, we can hear you, sir. All right, okay. So, uh, I will again skip this, but uh, cover it in a later date. So, basically, it's another topic, uh, design of continuous pre-stress concrete beams. But I can actually show you a fairly straightforward method. So, uh, rather than looking at the conclusions, now we'll uh, stop sharing. And I will, uh, I would, I wish to share some information about the concrete uh, technology. So, because we are going to talk about reinforced concrete, so let's uh, learn about concrete first. So, how to make concrete? And and you might say making concrete is not a big deal. You get cement, sand, metal, water, and mixture, mix it, you get concrete. Yes, that's true. But the question is how to get concrete economical mixes. Mixes. So this is the question. So that's one, right? So this is Civil Engineering Sectional Committee, uh, lecture number two. Today is uh, 21st to 2023. Page number one, right. So, what are our challenges? Economical mixes. Number two, no BEF. Number three, less carbon footprint. Why? Six percent of world's CO2 emissions associated with what? Cement production. So, these are the burning problems that we have to answer. So, to do that, first I will look at 50 years ago. And now, and we are going to look at the type of cements that are available in Sri Lanka. Cements available in Sri Lanka. 50 years ago, we had uh, sandstar cement. So what is the composition? In uh, cement, we get tricalcium silicate. 
we get dicalcium silicate we get tricalcium aluminate we get tetracalcium aluminate so these are impurity right so what happened what is the purpose of the, all these compounds one day up to 14 days this is active and this is one hour up to 24 hours sorry uh, this is from 14 days up to infinity no limit the reaction continues so that's why you know in sometimes uh, if you have a cube uh, cast with all uh, cement and you keep it for a few years test it and you might find uh, they have used something like 60 megapascal of heat or 70 megapascal. How? Why? It's because uh, there's, uh, there's plenty of dicasium silicate in those days and the reactions continued. And uh, this is one hour up to 24 hours. Now, what is the advantage? There are many advantages of having tricalcium aluminate because it, it allows us to remove the formwork after 24 hours. Because it allows us to uh, gain sufficient strength to remove the formwork in 24 hours. Then, as I ex told you earlier, the initial tricalcium aluminate is small, but when it reacts, it becomes bigger. So it's bigger. So when you you also know as concrete hardens, the, the excess water evaporates. Excess water evaporates. So there will be shrinkage of concrete. And who will compensate for the shrinkage of concrete? The bigger volume of tricalcium aluminate will squeeze in and adjust so that the concrete shrinkage can be reduced to a significant level. Concrete shrinkage can be, or cement shrinkage of cement can be reduced to a significant level. So, uh, 50 years ago, people used 50% of this. And 25% of this, about 8 to 10% of this. Now, let's see what happened today. C3S responsible for strength from 1 to, uh, 1 to 14 days. Today we have 65 to 70 percent. Huge percentage of tricalcium silicate. And we also get dicalcium silicate. It's responsible from 14 days to infinity. And today we have only 5%, 5 to 10%. And this has not changed 1 hour to 24 hours. And uh, uh, and the percentage used to be about 8 to 10%. Even today it's 8 to 10%. Right. And this is impurity maybe about 10%, even today it's about 10%, not, not significant. It is not affected by heat of hydration. Is this clear? Is this clear? I'm going to uh, actually move on to the next step, which is very important. Uh, if it is uh, not clear, you can ask any question you have. Or put it on the chat. I can have a look at the chat. Uh, today, so far, nothing in the chat. So basically, this is the theory. Now, we see how this affects us today. How this affects us today. So today, uh, we are all interested in uh, rapid construction. So, if you have learned theory, and you will find, we learned 
after seven days, concrete will get two thirds, 28 day expected strength. After 28 days, we get about uh, one pound. So what happens? I think there's some some this something happened to what's the, the zoom, but now it's okay. Uh, you can see the white white sheet. Yes, sir, we can see. Right. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, what happens today is we are into this. So today we have a curve that goes like this. But it flattens like this and continue like this. Very little gain after about seven days. But very rapid increase in strength. But uh, what, what are the problems associated with this rapid increase? Uh, earlier we had a lot of uh, tricalcium silicate, uh, but uh, Lot of dicalcium silicate as well. So when you cast at 30 degrees, gradually it rises and gradually dropped. This is the temperature of concrete. But what happens today? Today we cast here. Sometimes even during casting, it's difficult to keep the temperature down. We go for a path like this and comes down. But if we now there's a magic number, 70 degrees. What will happen if we cross 70 degrees? We have a huge section. Somewhere in the center, you will find now it is exceeding 70 degrees. So you will start again getting high calcium aluminum. So you can't see any problem. It's perfect. No problem. You got the strength. You had, you have created some problem inside the pie caps or large pores, but still you can't see it. Every time, if, you, if it happens that some moisture goes in, then this will become bigger and it ex started exerting pressures all over the block. And that can lead to the kind of cracking I showed you. And sometimes this might happen, but you might not see it. Why? The design engineer knowing this kind of problems with construction has allocated a lot of reinforcement into the pipe pipe. Like uh, H25 bars at 125 center to center. Huge amount of reinforcement in the pile cap, and uh, and uh, and because the reinforce huge amount of reinforcement was there, uh, this reinforcement was able to actually resist, resist most of these outward pressures, and uh, you might find that there's no problem. So, but still there could be a problem. On the other hand. Uh, what is uh, what is noted by many people who investigated the pile caps of Southern Highway was uh, because the the bridge was on precast piles like this. Generally, uh, my recommendation is if you have a bridge, try and have it on a raft foundation or a board in situ cast piles, large diameter. I'm not really particularly keen on this kind of small piles due to many reasons and especially the bridges on a major highway don't go for this type of foundation or this, they go for this foundation. And then never try to use inclined piles, precast piles to provide lateral stability because in an earthquake situation all these Inclined piles can fail, and that can lead to the failure of a pitch. So, what is recommended is this, and what we found was uh, what many others have found was these have been very lightly reinforced, and uh, because of that reason, when the pressures were exerted, because they did not take any 
special precautions with the concrete and uh, there are pressures developing and those pressures can lead to huge amount of cracking. So this is uh, this came as a sudden eye opener for Sri Lankan uh, Sri Lankan uh, construction community because uh, uh, the reason is you know we did not worry too much about this earlier so we don't have first we did not have much first hand experience. There are two reasons. One is, uh, early days we used uh, this more desirable type of cement with here, which we actually went in a lower curve. Then we used this type of cement and that went in a bigger curve, a larger curve, a higher curve, and that would have actually exceeded. So this is, there are many reasons why we did not know about this. But now it has happened in a major project. And now we cannot say we don't know. Now we have to say, oh, yes, we are aware of the problem. And uh, how we also know how to handle it. And how do you handle it? If the, if the core is very big, arrange some pipes network to take water into the, into the large member and cool it and cool it. But uh, you know this is very expensive because you will lose all these GI pipes and you know today GI pipes are very very expensive. So how can we actually uh, solve this problem uh, of uh, delayed ettingite formation? How can we solve it? And there is a solution. Now today we have uh, coal power plants <coughs> that produce fly ash. Type F fly ash. Uh, so, because of the type of coal that we use, that produces type F fly ash, which does not, which contains very little uh, calcium hydroxide. But it has posidinic, uh, the other chemical that can give rise to posidinic action. And because of uh, that reason, uh, so it, it acts as a posolona. So, basically, posolona is something. That is going to react with the byproducts of cement, heat of hydration of cement, and produce further cementitious material. So, what happens is we now go for a different study. And this is our earlier curve, and this is the new curve. And the advantage of earlier curve was it was it used to go like that. The disadvantage is today's curve is you know it goes flat. What we do is we are, we we mix with about twenty percent fly ash. And when you do that, now if you have three hundred twenty five kilograms per meter cube, and twenty five percent of that means. 25 multiplied by 0.85. So you have only about 276 kilograms of cement and you have about 49 kilograms of per meter cube of fly ash. So once you have fly ash, the, the density of concrete also reduces slightly. And uh, what happens is now we go in a different path. So because the cement, this come into the play at a later date, uh, this 49 will, count, will be called because this is how it happens. Tricalcium silicate, we have plenty now, plus water will produce uh, tricalcium silicate uh, hydrated product, which, which has water in it, plus uh, calcium hydroxide and this calcium hydroxide will react with fly ash and produce further tricalcium silicate further tricalcium silicate so what this means is 
Now the strength development will be at a lower rate. Why? We are having less cement, although we say we are having 325 cementitious material. Actual cement is only 276. So now what happens is, again it will move like this. But the advantage is, now it's not going to stop. It's going to go like that. The reason is, by ash, uh, the reaction with fly ash comes at a later date. So, now we have a very favorable situation. And this favorable situation comes in a different manner as well. And that is with the heat of hydration. This curve, pretty easily we can keep it below 70 degrees. And if you are keeping it below 70 degrees, there's no chance of uh, getting uh, a tringite formation. And there's another particular advantage that is when the heat of hydration is high, sometimes you get various kinds of facts in form. Because it's, uh, if it's raised to a higher temperature, now it's cooling down, the concrete is immature, yet not fully hardened. So, so basically, there can be many, many unforeseen situations. And we say, you know, we did a concreting and we did took all the precautions till it cracked. So, these kind of stories are very common. And most of the time, it is because you know, we have used too much cement and very little fly ash. So the idea is we make use of the waste product to replace 15% of cement with that. And uh, fly ash cost will be only about 10 to 15 rupees per kilogram. Whereas uh, cement cost is now uh, 2,500 divided by 50. Uh, it's about 50 rupees. Cement is about 50 rupees. Fry ash is only about uh, 10 to 15 rupees. So you can see uh, by uh, adding fry ash, you are going to reduce the cost of uh, cement uh, needed to make one meter cube of concrete. So that's another advantage you can gain by uh, using fry ash. So because of that reason, we strongly recommend uh, the use of fry ash. And in some projects, actually, we write saying that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, use fly ash, 15% fly ash, because it's particularly advantageous. And the moment uh, you specify that, uh, if the contractor, if, uh, you have, if you have a contractor bidding with his own, uh, own batching plant, then that person might uh, immediately detect this and he might start quoting lesser value for one meter cube of concrete. And uh, then sometimes you find that, you know, that particular contractor wins the tender because uh, he has, uh, there's a huge quantity of concrete and because you have uh, very early spelt out that uh, you are going to, uh, you know, you request you are going to have 15% fly ash in all concrete. The annoying that fly ash comes for about 15 rupees a kilogram, whereas cement comes for about 50 rupees a kilogram. You might find that uh, that particular contractor has quoted slightly lower value for uh, the entire concrete volume. And because of that, uh, suddenly he has become the lowest bidder or the, uh, or the one that is actually uh, going to give you a very cost effective uh, uh, solution. So if the design is good, he's going to do a good, good building or good construction or good bridge for you because uh, uh, that person knows that uh, concrete contains 15% fly ash. But on the other hand, how could this help the design engineer and the consultant and the project manager? Now, let's say, you know, we get a marginal result. You know, it goes and uh, it, it, you have specified uh, 30, 37 concrete. 30 means cylinder stem. 37 means tube stem. So you have specified 30, 37 uh, uh, concrete and after 28 days 
you test the cubes and you find that the cube strength is only 36. But uh, you don't have to worry too much. Why? The reason is we are on a curve like this. The curve is going to go up and up and up. So there's a particular advantage. On the other hand, uh, you can look at this. Now, in when you are doing con reinforced concrete, we need a cover. Now, why do you need a cover? We need a cover because uh, there will be enough uh, tiny pores in concrete and uh, these are filled with calcium hydroxide. If you cure it properly, then you get fairly strong concrete. But irrespective of the strength of concrete, uh, some uh, reactions can take place calcium hydroxide reacting with calcium carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and producing calcium carbonate and also some um, dissolved calcium hydroxide also can, could be there. So because of that you will find the pH value of this kind of concrete is 12 to 13. So what is the advantage? Uh, so all these metals have an oxide layer. So this is having an oxide layer. Now this ferrous oxide layer is very stable. Very stable. When pH is 12 to 13. So you don't get any corrosion of reinforcement when you insert a reinforcement into concrete. The reason is it is not the facts or anything. It is the fact that the the Concrete, the concrete is uh, providing protection to reinforcement because it's having a high pH value. That is the reason. Now, with time, what happens? This carbon dioxide penetration starts. And when the carbon dioxide penetration, we say it's a carbonation. We call it carbonation. So, when you have carbonation, what happens? Calcium, now you don't get calcium hydroxide, you are getting calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate can be, again, uh, uh, you know, can be in the form of bicarbonic acid. And because, because of all this acidity, now you will find pH is reduced to about 10 or 9 to 10. Because uh, all this alkalinity is now reducing. Then what happens? Earlier we had the protective layer. Protective layer can be damaged. Because this, uh, as the pH value drops, the, the oxide layer becomes weaker. And it can be attacked. So you have the cover. Carbonation is reaching. pH is dropping pH value is dropping and then you find the corrosion starts. The problem with corrosion is ferrous, ferrous oxides. Ferrous is this, ferrous oxide is that. So it's bigger volume. We start pushing this concrete out and you get cracks forming under the reinforcement and then losing that portion of this is a huge problem and how you do how do you minimize this problem one is adequate cover one is adequate cover what is the next problem next one. adequate curing curing why 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 do why do we recommend adequate curing because when you allow curing, the reactions will continue and you will get a greater concentration of calcium hydroxide, which is the byproduct. And then, then uh, when calcium hydroxide is plentiful, it will start reacting with uh, fly ash and produce further calcium, tricalcium silicate. So you get a strong a molecular structure and you get 
uh, strong concrete and and also the all these tiny pores that occur due to evaporation of water will now be filled with calcium ions so so the surface will become dense full of calcium hydroxide and and then cover is also significant so you will find it takes 50 to 100 years to reach the uh, the, the reinforcement so that's why you will see that you know in euro code there are different tables and at the beginning of uh, euro code it tells you about the the cover requirement the cover requirement for different exposure classes so if you look at bs uh, sorry euro code 2 the first code which deals with the concrete in uh, concrete technology and all that and it is a lot about buildings and in that uh, you there's a, there's a table which tells us uh, so many different types of exposure and uh, depending on the type of exposure you have to decide a reasonable cover and then add 10 millimeters to that to allow for construction variations so the 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 value recommended in the table is 30 millimeters. The cover requirement will be 30 plus 10, 40 millimeters. So when you have 40 millimeter cover, it's a fairly thick cover, you have a disadvantage because you are going to lose part of the lever arm. Yes, if, the, if the steel is far away, lever arm is bigger. If the steel is, uh, is placed with extra cover, then the lever arm will be lower and you will find that the, the section can carry lesser moment. But uh, we really don't worry about it these days. We actually like to have proper cover plus 10 millimeter allowance so that uh, we can actually assure the adequate level of durability uh, for the Structure so that it can easily last between 50 to 100 years. But when you do not look into these aspects, you will find very easily the concrete members can uh, start corrosion. So that has to be stopped. Right? So basically, uh, that will give you some insight into the, 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 the concrete technology part and why we should be using fly ash and what are the different types of uh, concrete that is, allow that is allowed and uh, in Eurocode they recommend us to use C30-37 concrete C37-37 concrete which means they are recommending us to go for uh, 37 megapascal concrete on cube strength But uh, how do you get 37? Now that is a question, right? So before, because before we actually try to optimize concrete, we should know how to get concrete. So, because especially when you are doing bridges for Euro codes, you will find that you know it allows you to even use uh, much stronger concretes like 3745. So this is 3037. There's another concrete called 3745 which is uh, 45 megapascal concrete cube strength. I mean, we are talking about fairly large strengths, high strengths, and how do you achieve it? So before we actually move on to the details of how to optimize a concrete structure, first we will see how to make it durable, how to make it durable. And to make, to make it durable, we have to go for curing. We can go for high strength concrete, and also we can provide adequate power. So the next thing is, if you are talking about high strength concrete, how do you, how do you get high strength concrete? Because uh, you, if you know how to get the concrete only, you will have confidence that you know we can actually successfully design bridges that can be constructed by the people in the uh, sites. Otherwise, you will do a design and it cannot be constructed. So we have to assure that the constructability has been taken into account by the design engineer. 
So, so before we go deeper into concrete design, uh, but we will first see how we can assure uh, gaining uh, adequate strengths like uh, 37 megapascal, 45 megapascal and so on. So I will again, uh, uh, though we are talking about Eurocode, Eurocode allow us to use cylinder strength or the cube strength. For all our design calculations, we use cube strength, cylinder strength in Sri Lanka like uh, C25, C30 or C37, uh, that type of calculations. But when you are doing the quality assurance, we generally still use cubes because um, it's very easy to find cubes, uh, higher cubes. Those things are very easy. But if you start talking about cylinders, still we are not very familiar with that and it's difficult to get cylinders at sites in adequate numbers. And if you don't get enough uh, cubes, uh, you can easily hire cubes uh, from various people. Whereas if you try to hire cylinders, you will find that, that is not that easy. So because of that reason, still in uh, Sri Lanka, when it comes to quality assurance, we use the cylinder strength, we use the cube strength. But whereas for structural design purposes, we, we go with uh, cylinder strength. But fortunately, a Euro code supports both. It says C2530 means 30 is cube, 25 is cylinder. And it also supports C3037. And C3745. There are so many different mixers that, that comes with the strength. And you might ask why the cube strength gives a higher value than the cube. The reason is uh, when you are testing, we have heavy steel platons of the testing machine. We place it and apply the load and the cube breaks like this. But in this failure, now there's some kind of confinement. And this confinement is actually affecting the expansion because when you apply a stress this way, and this way you get new time sigma. And when you have additional restraint, the impact of new time sigma would be lesser. So you, you will find that uh, cube strength is, uh, the actual strength is the cylinder strength. Because cylinder is tall, this effect of platens is much lesser, like this. So the effect is lower, and because of that reason, you get actual strength. So it's actual strength. And cube strength, cylinder strength is about 0.8 times cube. 0.8 times cube strength. So cylinder strength is 0.8 times the cube strength. So, so these are general guidelines. Now let's see how to get uh, 30 megapascal cube strength. I'm not talking about 37. I'll start with 30 uh, because uh, 30 megapascal concrete is widely used in Sri Lanka. Widely used in Sri Lanka. Is that right? You use a lot of uh, C, uh, 30 megapascal concrete. Can somebody give an answer? Right. So, now let's see. We want to make concrete. So how do we make concrete? First we need cement. We need sand. We need aggregate. We need water. And when you do all this, we end up with wet concrete. Cement. If you want 30 megapascal concrete, there's a simple formula 30 multiplied by 10 plus 50. 350 kilograms per meter cube of cement. And uh, the wet density of concrete is about 2,500 kilograms per meter. 
and the amount of water that you generally need is 200 kilograms per meter cube. Out of all these things, we know the de weight density is 2500. It consists of 350 of cement plus 200 of water plus sand, let's say A, aggregate B, A plus B. Now you can always find A plus B is equal to uh, 1950 kilograms per meter. Now, what is say, what is B? Generally, B should be 1.5 times A. So, B over A ratio for concrete can vary between 1.5 going up to about 1.9 or even 2. Right? So, you know the ratio and let's start assuming that is the lowest ratio, 1.5. That means, you know, anything more means more aggregates. But uh, we generally don't like to go below 1.5 either because uh, then that means uh, that is a concrete consisting mainly of sand and very little aggregate, which is not desirable. We like concrete to be a lot of aggregate and less sand. So because of uh, that or less mortar. So, because uh, when when mortar goes into the uh, spaces in the aggregates, so all these uh, spaces will be filled by mortar, and we like it to be a strong mortar. And how do you make a strong mortar? Is by using a uh, lesser amount of sand. The cement quantity is fixed, sand quantity is lesser. Then you will get a mortar which is very strong. But you can't uh, make it very small because then you find that it's difficult to compact. So you have to find the right balance. This 1.5 ratio is a very good one. So, so that means A is equal to 1950 divided by 1 1.0 plus 1.5, 2.5. So the amount of uh, sand needed is 1950 divided by 2.5. And that is 780 kilograms. And then we can straight away find B, that is 1950 minus 780. And that is 1950 minus 780, 1170. So now you will get a mix consisting of these numbers. And uh, when you do the concreting carefully, and uh, again we'll see whether we need 190 kilograms, 195. So do we don't add 200 straight away. We we first add little lower quantity, and then uh, adjust the work adjust according to the work. So this is going to be 780, and this is going to be 1170. Right. Now we also know. That uh, 30 megapascal concrete, we can make use of admixtures. And there are so many different types of admixtures and water reducing admixtures are there. And also, fast sizes are there, super plus sizes are also there. And these days, you will find that the super plus size type, uh, uh, sorry, uh, super plus size like uh, adcrete uh, or uh, or there are so many different trade names and they are very popular. So, if you are using uh, uh, water reducing admixture, so especially a super plus sizer, what happens to the water content that you need? It will reduce to about 160. What will happen to the weight density? Is it? it does not change very much. It does not change. And what will happen to the amount of cement you need? You don't need a lot of cement. Why? Because now we are going to use less water, less water. And you know, lesser the amount of water, higher the strength. Lesser the amount of water, higher the strength. So because of that, now we can reduce this to about 220. And when you do that, you will find 2500 minus uh, 320 minus 160. 
the answer is 2020 and uh, if you are going to maintain this same ratio you have to divide it by 2.5 so the sand content is 808 808 and uh, so 2500 minus 300 so 808 into 1.5 you get the uh, aggregate content 1 2 so straight away now you know how to adjust the cement content according to the according to the uh, admixture. So if it is a super plus size, you get 160 here. If it is a plus size, you get about 175. And if it is just a water reducing admixture, you get about 100, uh, 180. What it is in 180, uh, super plus size about 170, so plus size is about 170, super plus size is about 180, 160. So you have to actually uh, see uh, the, the numbers and get it. And then now we like uh, use fly air 15%. So 320 multiplied by 0.15. So you get about 48 fly ash and 320 minus uh, 48, you get about 272 uh, cement and uh, we are using the super plus size 160 and because we are having fly ash we get about 2470. Because we are using fly ash uh, there will be a Slight reduction in the density, slight reduction in the density, weight density. So you get 2470 minus 21 uh, minus 320 minus 160 uh, divided by 2.5. You get a 796 sand multiplied by 1.5, 1194. So you can see it's very easy to look at the numbers and adjust the quantities uh, depending on what we are doing. And so this is, you'll find this method is very much simpler than the, the standard mixed design method because sometimes you do everything according to the standard mixed design method, still pretty hard to get what you need. Then you turn to the batch vacuum plant. But here now you can see with this kind of simple technology, it's very easy for us to start adjusting the numbers. And uh, sometimes uh, you get this, and uh, and uh, you might find that uh, uh, you can even uh, use slightly more cement because the cement content has come down to 272. You might go up to about 275.80 because it's a slight adjustment you are making uh, to assure that uh, we'll end up with uh, adequate strength at the end of uh, 28 days, but uh, it will continue to rise uh, even beyond 28 days. Right? So, this is the kind of concrete technology part. So, in the next, uh, uh, next Tuesday, I will explain how we can. Uh, uh, make use of all this knowledge on concrete technology to produce uh, very cost effective uh, reinforced concrete figures right so so i'm trying to build up the knowledge base so that's why i didn't want to go in directly into the concrete bridges because you know if you don't know the concrete technology properly it's very difficult to design a reinforced concrete bridge with confidence so to design it with confidence, you need a lot of uh, in-depth knowledge on concrete technology and also the kind of uh, cements that are available today. So that's why I covered this part. So with that, uh, shall I end today? And uh, with this uh, knowledge that we have gained today, today uh, next Tuesday, I'll explain how we can uh, make the concrete bridges more economical. Okay. Shall I have a lecture with that? Yeah, sir, so there are several comments in the chat box. All right, uh, right. I, I can actually quickly answer them. Yeah. So.
So, please, can you please circle the presentation before explaining? So, here, right, okay. I recommend curing method. Uh, so, basically, uh, the, the, there's no nothing called curing uh, if, if you are doing a mass concrete uh, where you are actually think if you think that the temperature is going to, uh, going to go above 70 degrees you can have to actually go with uh, metal pipes and uh, do, cool the concrete and uh, So basically, uh, in Sri Lanka, we can, we have gone up to 25% uh, fly ash ECD, and in Middle East, uh, they have gone up to 35%. If possible, in one of the big pores, we also use 35% uh, fly ash in Sri Lanka. But uh, but by Middle East, uh, we they go for high fly ash content is because Middle East uh, environments are very aggressive. They have uh, uh, chloride problem and they have sulfate problems. So, fly ash is a very good solution for both chloride attack and sulfate attack. So, uh, and also in Middle East, the temperatures are very high. So, they want to completely slow down the heat of hydration. So, that's why they have gone for something like 35%. But in Sri Lanka, we generally prefer uh, 25 to 30, uh, 15 to 25%. And when you use 15%, you don't get many problems. But when you are going for high strength concrete, like uh, say uh, 50 megapascal concrete, uh, it's good to go for higher percentage, like 20% or 25%. So, so, but when you are using lower strength concrete, you have to be a little concerned because this particular number is also important. The minimum cement content is also important. So generally, the minimum cement content recommend is, recommended is about 250 to 275. So uh, I prefer a minimum cement content of about 275 plus fry ash. And I don't like to go too low below 275. But when you are using high strength concrete, like uh, 50, 60 megapascal concrete, what actually happens is uh, we need about 500 cementitious material. Then you can go for something like 375 uh, cement and 125 fly ash ECD. Uh, so, so you will get 25% uh, fly ash content. But uh, when you exceed 25%, you have to be extremely careful with the concrete because sometimes things can go wrong. So that's why, you know, in Sri Lanka, we generally don't use, uh, don't use uh, Anything about 25% as a regular regular application. But when there, when there are special applications where you can actually cast cubes and then uh, determine whether it's, it's going to gain strength and you are happy with what's going on, then you can certainly go up to even 35%. But uh, uh, as a general maximum, it's better to keep 25%. And uh, so... So basically, fry ash is cheaper, and if you can actually buy fry ash, buy fry ash, uh, then uh, then it's good uh, uh, that you know you do the site mixing or uh, mixing at the batching plant, uh, buying the fry ash. But if you go with uh, cement mixed with fry ash, then you will be paying uh, fifty rupees per kilogram for fry ash as well. So there are sometimes you can do the you can buy cement that has fly ash already mixed, but the moment you mix fly ash with with 50 into the fly, you bring fly ash into the fifty kilogram bag, you are actually uh, paying uh, the same price for cement. Uh, so which means uh, fly ash also comes at a higher price. So that will all depend on the facilities you have. Sometimes you like to reduce the cost, but you don't have facilities for mixing fly ash. Then, then the only option will be uh, buying a cement that has already got fly ash in it. So, so there are so many different options for you. But uh, fly ash is particularly uh, useful because fly ash can actually improve the workability. 
fry ash can actually improve the workability. So we like to use fry ash. And sometimes if you are not sure of the quality of the fly ash, again, better to go for a cement where the fly ash is already mixed. On the other hand, you know, you are sure that of the quality of the fly ash you are getting and uh, there's a good fly ash supplier with uh, quality assurance, then certainly you can go with, uh, you can mix fly ash at the site and uh, save money. So there are so many different options available for you. Uh, have I answered almost all the questions? Any other question you want to ask? Shall I end the lecture now? Yes, sir. That's all I, it seems. Yeah, it seems uh, that's all, right? Okay. So we we'll continue. So because with this knowledge, I'm going to continue, but uh, I will uh, send the presentation to you today and it has the part that uh, we we are going to cover next week. And oh, that that's good, sir. For concrete videos, okay? For concrete videos, okay? Okay, we, we will share okay. it. Okay. So, so I, I will share it with uh, 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 Nidhiya Kamala Gunawadhan and, uh, and uh, can you indicate your your email? Yeah. Yeah, professor. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Banduka. I think I. It's. Uh, I will first of all. I'll say good evening to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it is such an honor for me to deliver. I will do the word of thanks now. We have of the civil engineering sectional committee this evening. Uh, actually, today's lecture was an, on the topic: the structural design of five bridges uh, under cost-effective bridges with reinforced concrete, and it's a continuation from the last week. I take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks uh, to you, Professor Tichan Jaisinghe. Thank you. Sharing your valuable experience, knowledge, and opinions. And I hope everyone gathered a lot of things and deep from your lecture and was refreshed the knowledge of our senior engineers who are joining this series. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. For spending yeah, thank with, you. with us, even with this, with your busy schedules. Actually, I must mention my deep sense of appreciation to ISS Secretariat, especially Mr. Chamil and Chamra, and other involved for supporting advertising, hosting, and other arrangements. Thank you, Inyo Banduka, taking the interest and in coordinating the series as the leader of the Knowledge Sharing Subcommittee of Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. Last but not least, dear participants, thank you very much for your active participation. Without you, we can't do this event uh, as a success one. And hope you will continue to join this lecture series on every Tuesdays. Uh, I think we have organized eight lectures. Uh, no, Professor? Yeah, it or more because you know because uh, sometimes we take more than we have one and a half hours. So sometimes it might take a little longer. So based on that, uh, we will we'll continue. It might be eight or even uh, sometimes it might go up to about 12 lectures. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, as long as, uh, you know, yeah, I don't want to right. do it fast so that, you know, if we do it slowly, uh, everybody can uh, gain the knowledge well. So we yeah. uh, can do it for, but I have given about eight topics, so we'll try, try and cover all eight topics here. Yeah, thank you, and it's actually well, uh, well, uh, it's a well designed program this time. Uh, I mean, we continued about 40, 26 lectures last last session. So yes. you are comprised, uh, compressed, and doing it uh, in a better way. Thank you yes. for that also. Have a great evening, everyone. Yes, and also I have already sent the presentation to you. If you can actually share it with the participants, it's good. Uh, okay, yeah. I have okay. emailed the presentation to you. Okay, thank you. We'll do. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.